up out of my way. Okay, good evening, everybody. Great to see such a great crowd here. Obviously, Dr. Schur's reputation precedes him. Um, my name is Patrick Reeks. I'm the chair of the Humanities and Social Sciences Library at the University of Florida for the uninitiated. That's Library West. That's right over here is the common name. Um, we're really pleased to introduce this third event in a new program series offered here at Smathers Library called Authors at UF. The Authors at UF program is designed to showcase UF authors and their works, scholarship, or other creative endeavors, and to provide a forum for discussion and communication between the author and UF faculty, students, and staff, as well as the greater Gainesville community. <clears throat> this is an effort to focus on the wealth of scholarship and the literary accomplishments here at UF, and to raise the profile of UF authors within our own university community. In addition to this face-to-face -face event, we're launching a new Authors at UF bookshelf, an online introduction to the author, his or her works, and how to access them. This Authors at UF bookshelf is now located in the UF Digital Collections, which you can access through the library's homepage. We think it's very appropriate for the Smathers Libraries and the Humanities and Social Sciences Library in particular to provide an opportunity for scholars in the community to come together outside of the classroom and in a more informal way to talk about their work, their passion for their subject, what in particular motivates them, and to provide a forum for students and other faculty and staff to engage in an interactive dialogue with the author. This is also a chance for us to reach out to UF authors, their departments, faculty, and students, and to build bridges between academic librarians and those we serve. If you're aware of any other authors who might be interested in meeting with the campus community in this more informal way, please contact your library liaison, or Isabel Silver, who's right over there. And please don't hesitate to let us know if you have any suggestions for future programs. Our library liaisons are active players in the support of scholarship, literacy, and intellectual pursuit, and look forward to collaborations with academic departments on campus. In this case, David Schweder, political scientist, library liaison, and subject specialist, was familiar with the work of Dr. Schur, recognized the timeliness of his latest book, and thought it would provide an excellent opportunity for the community to engage with him on this topic. We hope you enjoy this evening's program and encourage you to complete the feedback form which has been provided. Right now, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. David Schweder, our political science librarian. David has a PhD and MSLIS from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, a master's degree from the University of Iowa. He serves as our subject specialist and liaison for political science and also our data services specialist for the humanities and social sciences. He'll introduce this evening's guest author. And we were going to have him do a debate tonight, but we heard there was a debate. Some guy's debating later on, so we're just going to go ahead. Thanks, Patrick. <clears throat> uh, greetings and welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. We appreciate it. Uh, in sponsoring this event, the Smathers Libraries were seeking to recognize Richard's book and the contribution that it's made. We weren't the first to do so. When the book was published in 2011, it received an Outstanding Academic Title Award from Choice Reviews, which is the review arm of the Association for College and Research Libraries. So we being librarians, we're kind of into books, especially good books, and we decided we'd like to award Richard a small memento of the occasion. So Richard, on behalf of Smathers Libraries, so I hope you'll accept this with our... Uh, Well, as Patrick alluded to, as most of you know, this is not the only interesting political event taking place last taking place tonight. Uh, later this evening, there will be a, the second in a series of presidential debates between the two major party candidates. Uh, both candidates will be attempting to uh, will be attempting to persuade voters to elect them president. And uh, but I think it's important to realize that persuasion is only part of the story here. Okay, persuasion is important, but it's meaningless without participation as well, without people showing up, turning out, okay, coming to the polls or going to the polls or some manner casting their ballot. 
And Americans, unfortunately, do not have a particularly salutary record with that. The United States ranks low among industrialized democracies for voter turnout. The usual, uh, usual argument for that is that it's voter apathy. But Professor Scheer has a different idea, different view on this. He's arguing, or going to argue, going to make the case to you that according to laws, policies, regulations, and rules, the United States is in the, has been is and in, is in that has been in the practice of disenfranchising voters by making it difficult or impossible for large numbers of voters to actually vote. That's his subject for tonight. But first, a bit of biography. Richard Scher is an accomplished academic. In addition to several monographs and numerous articles, he has written five books: Politics of Disenfranchisement, our book for this evening. Modern Political Campaign, Mudslinging, Bombast, and the Vitality of American Politics, which just as a personal note, I can recommend is the funniest political science book I have ever had the pleasure to read. Voting Rights and Democracy, The Law and Politics of Districting, Politics in the New South, Republicanism, Race, and Leadership in the 20th Century, and Florida's Gubernatorial Politics in the 20th Century, several of being co-authored works. One more book in progress, Getting What We Deserve, The Modern Political Campaign in America. Richard has received multiple honors. He's a multiple-time nominee for the College of Liberal Arts and Scientists Teacher of the Year Award, a finalist for that award, and in 1992-1993, winner of the class Teacher of the Year Award. Multiple-time nominee for College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Teaching Award, Multiple-time nominee, University of Florida Distinguished Alumni Professor Award, winner of the Special Faculty Recognition Award, University of Florida Senior Faculty Recognition Award from UF, twice winner of the Mortarboard Faculty Mentor Award, and a Fulbright Scholar, former Fulbright Scholar. Quite a lot, numerous amount of professional media consulting. Richard has consulted with national electronic print media, such as CBS, NBC, CNN, PBS, NPR, C-SPAN. Richard, I know you wanted a short introduction, but you're making things kind of hard for me here. The New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Time, Newsweek, AP, and Congressional Quarterly. Professional academic consulting, an invited presenter and panelist for the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, Florida's election reforms, June 2002, and an expert witness in numeral federal district court cases. So folks, please welcome... Um, Welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. One more program note before I finish here. Um, the University of Florida Libraries has made books available for purchase, and Richard has graciously uh, agreed to sign them following the event. So without further ado, uh, our guest, welcome our guest for a conversation with Richard Scherer. Well, thank you very much, Dave, and thank you, really, members of the Library staff, thanks. Um, I, in the interest of disclosure, um, I was on the committee, a, the library committee, to find Dave Schweder. And I, I really had had, you know, the usual experience of a professor, an academic, going to the library, which is to say, I saw a lot of familiar faces all the time, but I really didn't know anybody. So this committee was great. I mean, the, the chair was Blake Landor. Uh, Cindy was on it. Uh, Pauline was on it. Uh, we had a great time. We, we, uh, I just met some wonderful people, and we did indeed find Dave Schweder, which, of course, was the point of the whole thing. And uh, it was a wonderful uh, experience for me to work with p capable people people who really cared about libraries, who cared about books, who cared about the life of the mind. And so uh, I was very happy when it ended so successfully. And I'm just terribly flattered that, that the library has decided to give me a little bit of a feature here, actually a big feature, and give me a chance to talk with you about the book. And I, 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 I do think it's my best work. Uh, and I think it's an important thing, but you all can make that decision yourself. Um, hopefully you'll rush over after and buy many copies. Um, Dave asked me not to talk too long. Uh, he alluded to something important happening later, and then I was very disappointed to learn that he meant the debate. 
It's the Yankees and Detroit tonight. That's the real highlight of the evening. So, so I promise not to talk too long. But actually, I, 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 what I want to do uh, is just sort of give you a sense of what the book is about and then focus on two or three issues that are very important, particularly the, the voter IDs and what we call voter suppression that uh, seems to be very uh, prevalent these days and it actually has become a major campaign strategy of one of the parties. Uh, but I don't want to, seriously, I don't want to talk too long because I want to hear from you. I want to talk about what you're interested in. So I'll talk for a while. Uh, regrettably, that clock up there is no relationship to the real time. So I'll, I'm going to take the liberty of taking my watch off so I can actually see, see what it is. So yes, I, I'm a very informal person. I'm very gratified to see so many students here, and they know that my classes are so informal as to be chaotic at times. Um, but um, that's the way I, I envision the next few minutes with you. So how did I come to write this book? Um, well, as Dave pointed out, there's a, a, a major part of, of political science, American government in particular, is focuses on how is it that people decide to vote or not vote, or who are they going to vote for, and this and that. And there's whole shelves over there in the library of very learned books about stuff like that. And I, I, I must tell you, I'm not interested in that question. Uh, I'm, I've never been particularly concerned about political behavior. I'm much more interested in, a, in another question, is what happens to the person who wants to participate and, and in particular wants to vote and can't? And that happens. And you might think, well, how, how can that be? In this country, ever since the third grade, when we were in Mrs. Stonebreaker's class, we were told about we have the universal franchise and how we should all vote, and it's our duty, and it's this, and it's that. It turns out almost none of that's true. Uh, that we engage in a series of public policy decisions and practices that actually sharply limit the ability of many people and I'm talking hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of people, preventing, preventing them from voting. I was interested in that question. And then, of course, some of you will remember, we had the election of 2000 here in Florida. And I was struck when the, after the dust was starting to settle. I was struck by the fact that um, there were 180,000 votes in Florida alone not to speak of other states. There were 180,000 votes in Florida alone that were never counted. They just sat there. And for whatever reason, usually because of the ruling of some judge or this court or that court, they were not able to be counted. And about 130,000, roughly, the numbers are just approximate, but they are accurate. About 130,000 of that 180,000 came primarily from African-American districts, the precincts. So I, that, that I was very interested in the fact that how could they have, I could spend the rest of the time just telling you stories about what's in these 180,000 ballots. I was very interested in how that could happen. And then, of course, when the racial and sort of also poor people, it's, sort of, it's not quite the same thing, but when that um, element, shall we say, surfaced, I thought, well, here's something I need to, need to write about. And with the... Um, encouragement of Professor uh, Peggy Conway, who I don't think, she said she wanted to come, but wasn't sure she could find a parking space, uh, which is not, no surprise around here. Uh, but in any case, um, she encouraged me to write this book, and I'm very glad, very glad that I did. There's so many pitfalls to the very act of voting, and what I do in the book is to detail, maybe overly detail, every step of the way from qualifying to trying to find your polling station to the actual act of voting uh, to what happens uh, to that ballot, uh, to how it's counted, how it's recounted. I detail all of this. And, and friends, every step of the way, something can go wrong and often does, often does. But coupled with that is the fact that voting is a right not a constitutional right, but because of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, it is a, it is a right none, nonetheless. Um, 
The problem is that many people seem not to take it that way. Or maybe they think it's a second-rate right, because it's not in the US Constitution. Uh, many people see it more as a privilege, something that uh, people have to jump through hoops, something you have to earn, something that can be granted but taken away also, very much in the manner of a driver's license. Okay. That, that I, I was very troubled by that. Uh, and, and, it, and yet it seems that the way we treat voting, and particularly when it gets into very partisan politics, as we'll get to in just a moment, um, this is very, very disturbing. So let me tell you, just sort of briefly outline some of uh, the, uh, how the book structured and what it talks about, and then we'll get to the two things that I think are of greatest concern, at, the, at least at the moment. Certainly they've been in the news a lot. What are the barriers to election? What are the barriers to voting? What about this person who wants to vote and just all of a sudden discovers he or she can't? Well, the book talks about seven or eight of these um, just structural features of the voting landscape. But I'll, let me just mention a couple of them very, very briefly. As I, one I already mentioned is the fact that since voting is not always seen as the right that it is, it's not always uh, uh, granted, uh, and, and, uh, and particularly when issues of race and social class come to play, ethnicity also, uh, it's often granted or not. Um, and that's actually sort of another point to mention. I'm afraid racism and xenophobia are still very much with us, and it affects who gets to vote and who doesn't get to vote. Um, a third matter that I would mention, again, just briefly, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, uh, the enormous discretion that voting officials have from local supervisors. I'm, I'm not casting dispersions on anyone in particular, because uh, I think most of them do their job well, or at least try to do it well. But there's some that don't. For example, um, my wife and I were in a, this is two years ago, we were in a county to the northwest of here, and I won't mention it to spare the guilty. Um, we were told, and then I subsequently documented, a young man who showed up at the primary to vote. This primary, remember, was either August or early September. And he was wearing an Obama t-shirt. He was not allowed to vote. Now, the idea, apparently, of the local officials was that, well, this has constituted a campaign advertisement and violated the 50-foot rule, not recognizing that, of course, under Florida law, clothing is specifically uh, exempt from the 50-foot rule. So you can wear a T-shirt that says Karl Marx on it if you want to, or whatever, whoever. Um, and Mr. Obama was not on the ballot in 2010, and especially in the primary. Nonetheless, this young man was not allowed to vote. There was no accountability. And that's the sad part. That's the troubling part, not just sad. But so many of these things that happen, because of the discretion of local voting officials, even as I say, I think most of them try to do a good job in the decisions that they make, um, they can prevent people from voting. And again, maybe during the Q&A, I can tell you stories that have happened at once with my mother-in-law and then to when my wife and I were voting, just right here. And again, I think our local officials are probably very assiduous about trying to do it right, but they don't always. Okay, but maybe we'll come back to that. And then, of course, uh, the last one of these barriers that I'll mention, although the book goes through it uh, maybe too much, has to do with just the administrative apparatus, what we in political science would call the structural features of trying to vote. And they are, um, there are enormous, uh, enormous hurdles to be overcome, of which the most important and the greatest is um, the registration process. Um, we've known since the 1930s that the greatest hindrance to more voting turnout is voter registration. In this country, it is unbelievably cumbersome. Many other democracies around the world They've simplified it. They've streamlined it. It works very well. Um, but it's, ours is very difficult. And if I can, if this works. I just want to show you something. 
This is the um, Florida voter registration application. We're not going to go through it, fortunately. But I just want you to look at it. My friends, this is a, a literacy test. This is a literacy test. And under the 1965 Voting Rights Act, that, those are forbidden. This is, this is a ridiculously complicated form where you can go awry at any point. They've actually simplified it, believe it or not. It used to be, you notice here, you're, you're supposed to sign it. Up until a few years ago, you actually had to sign it twice for it to be valid. And then, of course, there's the issue of here, there are a couple of states besides Florida. You have to swear an oath, an oath to exercise your right. Now, I don't believe there's any other right that we have that I have to sign an oath before I can exercise it. But Florida puts this barrier. I mean, what happens, for example, if you want to register to vote and you're offended or somehow it, it, it's a, you feel it's a violation of your civil liberties, uh, that you have to sign this oath. What if you cross it out? Well, you know, again, this goes back to the discretion of the voting officials. They can throw out your, your application in spite of the fact that you have the right to vote. So this is the sort of thing that I talk about. Um, uh, and there are some ways around it, and I, uh, uh, I think uh, maybe we can, we can talk, to, talk about um, and I'm not going to use that anymore. You can find that online very easily. Um, and I go through a great deal more about the problems of structural barriers against voting, everything from finding your polling place, when is it open. Is anybody here from Austin, Texas? Austin, Texas is famous. I, it may have changed now, I don't know, but the supervisor in whatever county it is was famous for changing polling stations near the University of Texas um, on the morning of the election. Under Texas law, he or she had the power to do that. And so what would happen was they would, they would change the, they, they could change them up until the time the polls open when, I don't know what they are in Texas, probably 7 o'clock or something like that. Anyway, you could change the voting location. And even though you're supposed to notify the, the voter, they don't always. And so students at the University of Texas often went to their, you know, well, I'm going to vote before I go to class. Get them. There's no polling station. They have no way to find out where it's been moved, nor was, you know, was there, during the course of the day, was there any way to find out. So this is the sort of thing that happened. That may be an extreme example, but, but again, there's, there, when, when sort of political pressures, sometimes it's partisan politics, sometimes it's just they don't like students. They don't want them to vote. Um, we'll talk more about that in a moment. And um, they easily find ways to prevent their exercising their right to vote then from there, the book then goes through, and I'll go very quickly through this. Um, it, 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 the book shows that in our course of our history, uh, the uh, policy has often been exclusionary rather than inclusive, and that people were shut out, as you know, at the beginning of the, of the country. You know, you had to be a white um, property owner, white male property owner, before you could even be thought of as a potential voter. Well, that all went out the window, fortunately, by the first third of the 19th century. But of course, you, you know that of course, the long history of uh, exclusion of African American slaves in particular, not just in the South, even after the Civil War, uh, blacks were excluded elsewhere than in the South. Ethnic groups, um, almost every eth ethnic group that's come, immigrant group has come, uh, has had terrible problems. The Irish, the worst were the Chinese. Probably after African Americans, the Chinese have been treated the worst, not just in voting, but in every other way. Women, of course, couldn't vote. Uh, so, you know, historically, we have this pattern of let's only certain people can, you know, jump through the hoops, or do we let jump through the hoops? In the modern era, of course, we have quite a few groups whom were either disenfranchised or for whom we make it very difficult to vote. Felons, for example. Um, there are two states, uh, Maine and Vermont, where felons can vote. Uh, I don't think either one of them have been, you know, adversely affected from that. Many countries, many democracies, allow the fel about felons to vote, but we don't, and most of us. And then it's so difficult for felons in many states, Florida included, to have your um, voting rights restored after you've served your time. Non-citizens uh, can't vote. 
But which is funny, did you aware, were you aware that for most of our history, most of American history, non-citizens could vote? But it really wasn't until the 20s and 30s that, it was, that, the, that they were disenfranchised. Language minorities, the physically and mentally disabled, often very difficult for those folks to vote. Um, homeless, homeless really can't vote. Why? Because you can't show a permanent address which means that this is a means test, okay? And if it's a means test, that's forbidden specifically in the 1965 Voting Rights Act. It doesn't matter. Homeless people have a great deal of difficulty voting. And, of course, those under 18, and some people would say, well, you know, they shouldn't vote. But, you know, if you're 16, you can drive a car, so what's more injurious to the public, or potentially injurious to the public interest? Some kid driving a 2,000-pound car down the street at you know, 60 miles an hour, or going out to vote. California has addressed this issue, by the way, only in California. You might enjoy this. Some guy, I don't know who he is, and I don't know where this proposal is, you know, because California completely collapsed. Um, but they had a proposal where uh, people at age 15 would start to vote. They had a quarter of a vote. And then when they were 16, they got a half a vote. And when they were 17, they got three quarters of a vote. Only in California. Okay, but I don't, I don't know where that is. Um, and, then, and then there are other types of disenfranchisement that I can talk about, um, what I call functional disenfranchisement. And I, I won't spend too much time on it, except that this, this happens when you have the right to vote, but it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't count. Um, and, and there are a number of examples, for exa uh, instance, in reapportionment, when you redraw the legislative districts. Um, it's possible to gerrymander them in such a way that, you know, a Democrat, let's say, or a Republican, it works both ways, can't possibly win. There just aren't enough of them. So why vote? You are functionally disenfranchised. You can never elect your candidate of choice. That's the, that's the language that the, that the lawyers like to use. Um, or if you're an African-American or if you're a red-haired, left-handed person, they're just, they can be gerrymandered into oblivion. And that happens. Um, there are non-competitive elections, which effectively uh, disenfranchise you. I mean, if in the US House of Representatives, as you may know, um, the success rate for incumbents is oh, well over 95%. So what kind of an election is that? There's no sense in even having it. Because, you know, if, especially if you want to vote against the guy or woman, you have no chance of success. So I talk about this, what I call functional disenfranchisement. In the book, details every step of the way how things uh, can go wrong and often do. And often is a matter either of public policy or public practice. And I, I, I have, I think, those highly problematic in a, in a democratic system. But the biggest controversies right now, let me turn to for a few minutes anyway, uh, are two, because they're happening right now. These are, of course, the use of voter ID uh, cards and uh, the actual suppression of the vote. Now, the ID cards usually involve, um, there are almost 40, I think over 40 states that require some sort of special ID card. Now, it can be a number of things, it, but it almost always requires that it be government issued, that it have a picture, photo, and that it have a, um, uh, an expiration date on it. And what happens is that, uh, this, this creates an enormous burden for some people because they're expensive. Um, poor people, minorities, um, about approximately one-third of African-American males between the ages of 18 and 25 don't have driver's licenses, okay? They don't have a car or access to a car. So they don't have a driver's license. They're not likely to have a passport. They're not likely to have something else. I've mentioned students before in, in Virginia, as well as in a couple of other places. I think New Hampshire is the other one. Um, many states will allow you, if you're a student, to take your ID card, and you know, especially if it has a picture on it. But even if not, go to the polls, and you know that work. But they're specifically forbidden in some of these places because they don't want the students students to vote. The, 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 I think there are three problems with the voter ID that we need to think about. 
One is the cost. Uh, it's substantial. For $25 or whatever it is in some places, probably even more than that, uh, that's, that's a burden for many people. They simply, it's not worth it. Voting is not that important for them. Um, that, that's one thing. The other thing, or the second thing, is that until very recently, to pr prove who you were when you show up to vote, you could bring a variety of documents. Um, uh, I don't know, a bank statement, for example, a phone bill. You know, it says Joe Schmo lives at such and such an address. Okay, that's who you are. It's the same address as on the, you know, the, the voting list. That's enough. Um, even so, in the old days, some of you might remember, you could even just show your voter uh, registration form. But no more. And, and my argument would be that that is so, it so limits the possibility of showing up at the polls and being allowed to vote, I think that's, that's a serious violation of your, of your right to vote. In other words, we've, instead of expanding um, uh, the right to vote, out, my colleague at the, uh, at the Kennedy School, Alexander Kasar, has written a wonderful book called The Right to Vote. Now, his argument is basically that over the course of American history, the franchise has been expanded. And okay, and it, it's a plausible argument. It's a very nice book. I highly recommend it. It's a very good book. He's a very, very smart guy. <clears throat> but I think, and in in it is as always the case, that the, the devil is in the details. And when you limit the documents that you can bring to sh you know, show, yeah, I'm Joe Schmo and I live at this address, that's a real problem. That is not in increasing the franchise. But the third thing I think is the most important. Uh, my third objection to the uh, ID, which is that the shoe is on the wrong foot. So when you show up to vote, you have to prove that I'm Richard Schur. Why? Why should I have to prove that? In, in many legal proceedings in this country, the, the shoe is on the other foot. In other words, the other side has to prove that you're not who you claim to be. And I think in this case, it should be the state that prove, has to prove, the burden of proof should be on the state to say, you're not who you claim to be. But no, we're, we, we force the individual to come up with these basically artificial documents to prove who they are. And I think that creates a terrible um, burden, an unfair burden for, many, uh, for too many people. So that, we can talk more about that if you like in the Q&A. But let me say a little bit about voter suppression. Um, voter suppression um, <clears throat> is, uh, ostensibly has been designed, and it's the same with voter ID actually, but voter suppression, in other words, keeping people away, has been primarily aimed at um, preventing what's called voter fraud, voter fraud, um, in which, you know, you you know, say you're Joe Schmo, but you're really, really Larry Moe, and so you're, you know, you're, you're, you're engaging in a fraudulent activity. Um, Project Vote, which is uh, some of you may be familiar with, which is a very important think tank that studies issues of voting in this country, and a, and a professor at Barnard College, who's, who, uh, uh, young woman, very, does some, done some wonderful work on voter suppression, voter fraud. And her conclusion, and that of almost everybody else, is that there isn't any, or it's so little as to amount to nothing. I mean, the ratio is something like one case of fraud for every five million voters, or maybe it's 15 million. I don't even remember it. It's infinitesimal. You have a greater chance of be walking out this library in a half an hour or so and being struck by lightning than of, of being a victim of voter fraud. It just simply doesn't exist. And I would point to you this wonderful document that comes from Demos and the um, Common Cause called Bullies at the Ballot Box. And they go through and really show how little evidence there is for anything like uh, uh, voter fraud. And if, uh, but really, I mean, we have to be frank here. The whole emphasis of, of, of trying to suppress the vote has taken on a highly partisan character. It's designed to keep especially likely voters for Democratic candidates 
away from the poles. It's being conducted almost entirely by elements, shall we say, of the Republican Party. Now, I should hasten to add that from 1865 to 1965, it was the Democrats who were doing this, trying to keep people they didn't like away from the polls, especially blacks, especially in the South, but not only, and lots of other groups as well. That's with the Voting Rights Act, it sort of flipped, and that's when the Republican Party got, in, got into the act, and, there's, and they're, still, they're still involved in it, uh, uh, heavily so, trying in some places um, to keep people from voting. How does it work? Well, there's a variety of ways, and maybe we can talk about this, but, but for, for example, one that's very, very common and has been going on now for quite a while. Um, suppose, for example, I show up at the polls, okay, and I have my nice my passport or my driver's license, whatever it is, and some guy or some person there challenges me, which you can do. You can challenge someone's credentials. And so my driver's license is signed Richard K. Schur. Okay, so I almost always sign every, but sometimes I don't. Sometimes I just sign things Richard Schur. Well, suppose on the voting registration list, I'm listed as Richard Schur, not Richard K. Schur. I can be challenged on that. The address is the same. The, the, even the handwriting looks the same but the name is different. And that's how much of this goes forward, with challenges being made right there in the polling station. Now, that does two things. It keeps me from voting, but there's a line behind me, and people get disgusted. They say, well, the heck with this, I'm, 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 I'm leaving. Now, some people will say, well, you should be given a, a, a provisional ballot, what's called a provisional ballot. But that's, you know, nothing. I mean, that... That's a, just a ticket to the trash can, quite frankly. Uh, they, these are often not, not counted. Uh, so the suppression works largely by comparing signatures on lists or maybe addresses. Uh, in some areas, especially in rural areas and in very poor areas, addresses are not always as, you know, we, we, here in Gainesville or Alachua County, I mean, it, nobody thinks much of it. But there are still places that, you know, they don't really have an address. They have a, maybe a P.O. box or maybe just, you know, the house out on XYZ Road. Very hard to prove where that is or that you actually live there. Again, I think the burden should be on the state to prove that you don't live there. But it's so easy in the case of a challenge to say, I don't think this person lives where he or she claims to. Now, there are some states that, are, that have been moved very rapidly away from that. Um, I think it's Colorado, but I don't, don't quote me on that, now says that you can only challenge a voter, the credentials of the voter, if you're from the same uh, precinct, not just the same town, but the same precinct. And that will uh, probably cut down on a lot of it, uh, because literally car loads of people are brought in to certain areas, and guess where those areas is? Mostly poor people, mostly African-American people, mostly people who are inclined to vote Democratic. And they're the ones who are being challenged. They're the ones where the process gets, gets tied up. Of course, <laughs> now, um, and, and you know, so they, they, they challenge the sort of the whole, from start to finish, I just mentioned the, the challenge when you actually get to the polling station, but they challenge the uh, the, the registration itself. Well, you saw that form I put up there. It's so easy to make a mistake, especially if you're, you know, since it is, I think, a literacy test, uh, you can be challenged at any, almost any one of those squares. Um, what's happened in Florida, some of, may, may, uh, some of you may be aware of this, um, is that the Republican Party uh, got caught sort of with their, um, they got caught red-handed because uh, they hired this firm called excuse me, strategic allied consulting. It turns out they were going around uh, red, trying to register people, and it was pretty fraudulent, and they got caught, and that, all that went out the window. So, I mean, the best sort of medicine for this is publicity. Uh, but it's not going to stop, folks. It's, it's definitely not going to stop. Um, so, but, but the, nonetheless, there will be these continuing efforts, I think, to suppress uh, voter turnout through the use of comparing signatures by contesting addresses, by contesting your qualifications, uh, 
Uh, and, and you can bring the whole process to a screeching halt very, very easily. Now, having said that there are very, there's very little voter fraud, there's a lot of voting fraud, voting fraud. And the biggest culprit here, of course, are absentee ballots. And if I can recommend to you, try not to vote absentee because uh, they are so easily disqualified and they are so easily not counted. Often they are not counted um, unless somehow there are enough of them that it might affect the outcome of the election. Um, this time it looks like it might be another very close cliffhanger type of election. Who knows? Um, but I would urge you, if you possibly can, to go to the polls and actually cast your, your ballot. And, and I think a big help here is early voting, uh, which our governor unfortunately tried to stifle uh, and did in some, in some respects. Um, but at least we, we have had a few days restored. I noticed just this afternoon the U.S. Supreme Court uh, refused to hear a case in Ohio which reestablishes their um, early voting days. Uh, but Florida and Ohio are actually fairly stingy. It's just, you know, a, a week or two um, in Texas and Virginia, not where you expect it, but it's like 40 days. You have an enormous amount of time to vote. Um, so I, I think absentee ballots are dinosaurs, and I think they're going to eventually die through the use of early voting, through greater use of mail. Uh, Oregon and Washington now, you vote exclusively by mail. There's no voter fraud out there. There's no reports of it. The expense is probably less than conducting, you know, having polling stations. So there's a future there. I think eventually, not in my lifetime necessarily, but I think eventually there will be Internet voting. Um, the problems now are that um, you can't protect the secret ballot and they're too easily uh, hacked. So that's what, but those problems presumably will, will, will end. So let me end here, speaking of which. Uh, let me end here and ask for your comments and questions. But I, I just want to emphasize that, in, in conclusion, that we have the right to vote. But there are elements, shall we say, out there which don't always let us exercise it or make it very difficult, very, very difficult to uh, to exercise, and other countries don't do it that way. So thanks for listening. Let me stop there. And Dave, I don't really know what the next step is, but if anybody has a question. Bob? Right. Uh, touch screen voting, lack of a paper trail. You spoke toward the end, right at the very end, of uh, being fairly optimistic in the long run about elect certain kinds of electronic yeah, voting. Not that one. Yeah, we, we went through that one. Well, she seems to think that this is a major problem, not only in the actual mechanics of it, but in the corruption that's likely to occur mm -hmm. with who controls the software. Often it's tied in with uh, political donors and so on. Right. Could you talk a little bit about that issue? Yes, that? And, and actually I think that's correct. I mean, I'm in no way advocating with current technology and current safeguards that we move to, to um, uh, internet voting. It's, it was, it's been tried a couple of times. It's generally a nightmare, uh, exactly for the reasons I, I, I'd like to know where this article is, because it sounds very much like the current, uh, very current issue of Harper's. OK, well, I will look at that. I got yesterday in the mail. Because this is, it's very similar to this. Yes, and, and the, the, the politicization of the voting machines, as we know from 2000, became uh, uh, so rampant as to even Florida, even Florida said no more than touch <laughs> <reasons. laughs> and it's now outlawed. But the, 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 the more serious electronic issue has to do with hacking, has to do with the source codes, uh, has to do with the fact that they're non-transparent. For example, for example, Bobby raised a really good point. Um, I mean, I, I probably should have mentioned this earlier. But let's suppose, put yourself in the polling station. And, you, you know, especially in Florida, we use these optical scanner things. And, you know, if you've, if you've been in high school, you've taken standardized tests, so you know how to use those things. So you take the paper, and you stick it into the machine, right? How do you know what happens to it? How do you know what happens to it? See, at that point, 
I mean, you know, for example, they can tell you, they can tell you right away, you voted, you, Richard, sure voted. But it doesn't say that your ballot was counted. That's a very different thing. It doesn't say how it was counted. Because you can jimmy these things very easily so that, let's say, every second vote for uh, Mr. Obama is erased, or every fifth vote, or for Joe Blow. It's very, a 10 year old can do this stuff. I can't, because I'm not that savvy, but <laughs> kids can. Um, and, and so, what I'm saying, and I think you're getting the, to, the, to it, Bob, is, is that too much of voting in this country really is an act of faith. Uh, you assume, when you put that piece of paper in the mouth of the machine, that it's going to be counted, and it's going to be counted correctly, accurately, and tallied, and recorded, as you intended. There's no guarantee. Does that sort of speak to? I, I, I think we have a ways to go on that, OK, until it's completely transparent and accountable. Yeah, yes, John. Uh, the can uh, every election we have a canvassing board in this county this election it's made of three people the chair is the, uh, one of the local judges right on the 25th of october they start reviewing absentee ballots and the staff will give them ballots that have questionable signatures if they take a ballot they know the name of the voter they <coughs> compare it to his signature or her signature they accept it or reject it. It's a list of names. At that point, the person whose ballot was rejected, they haven't opened the envelope, cannot vote. They will send a letter after election day saying your ballot did not count. When they receive the letter, that's considered casting a ballot even though the ballot is never opened. They could easily contact the voter and say, your ballot didn't match. You do something else. Uh, <coughs> that doesn't make sense. Does no, it, it doesn't make sense. No, and this, ha this happens, it's one of the reasons why I, I think, <coughs> as I said, absentee ballots are dinosaurs. Uh, Aida and I were talking the other night with a friend of ours who was about to leave the, the area and wasn't totally sure he was going to be here for, for the election, so he might want to go absentee. So I suggested that he go down to the supervisor's office. You, any of you can do this at any time and see what your signature is on file. Change it if necessary. I was told the other day by a colleague, friend, um, about a mother who had a stroke about a year ago, no longer can use her right hand. How is she going to, how are those signatures going to match? But, but to go back to the point that I said before, canvassing board or not, so much, the voter, local voting officials have so much discretion, and it's all non-accountable. As far as I know, friends, only one voting official has ever been indicted, much less convicted, for fraud. And it really wasn't fraud about anything that had to do with the list. It was in Indiana. And it wasn't anything that had to do with the election. You know, it was about the guy apparently lied on his application about where he lived. And that was the point of contention. That's what the indictment came down. It had nothing to do with the fact that they're throwing, especially in Indiana, they're throwing voters out left and right. And that's where the famous ID, voter ID case came from, Marion, Marion County versus FEC. Uh, and it's, um, there's just so much discretion that these folks have, and they're never called to account. Yes, the date. Based on precedent and uh, federalism, are the issues that you mentioned issues of constitutionality or of just moral ethics, right and wrong? Well, it can get into the constitutional realm. I mean, if you, if you start to argue that based on, it, on 14th Amendment grounds, let's say, but keep in mind that there, that there is no constitutional amendment provide you with the right to vote. Now, if we had one, a lot of this would immediately end up in the federal courts rather than in the state courts. And some people would say that's better. I don't necessarily think so. Uh, but it, it, you, would have, you would be on sounder constitutional footing. Um, just to give another example, Florida, some of you might remember this, a year or so ago, Florida adopted a bunch of constitutional amendments about um, 
redrawing district uh, uh, house and uh, Florida Senate, Florida House uh, districts. People asked me at the time, was it going to make any difference? And I said, no. And of course it didn't. Except when you go to court, I've been there in these voting rights cases, and you go to court, and if there's no constitutional language, and the judge, one of the, so the three judge panel, the ju judge says to you, well, Professor Schur, uh, what are the criteria in Florida for drawing these district lines? Uh, 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 well, Your Honor, there aren't any. Now there are. And that was why those amendments were important. So, you know, I think that even, I think it would be very helpful to resolve some of these matters, or at least to provide constitutional standing for complaints if we had something in our Constitution that guaranteed you and me, Joe, you and me, uh, the right to vote, or all the rest of us. But I don't see that coming. Ambassador. Richard, uh, in a number of democratic countries, uh, the right to vote, is, there is no right to vote. There is a responsibility to vote, uh, i.e., you have to vote. And if you don't <laughs> vote, you're fine. Uh, which, in terms of statistics or whatever, could uh, it, it, it could bring a lot more people to the polls. It certainly does. Uh, I've heard people overseas say, well, you know, I have to vote because uh, I don't want to pay the $50 fine and I don't want to go through the bureaucracy with the government, etc. Would that be a solution to this and make it, you, you make it all inclusive that way that everyone has to vote? I mean, this is a hypothetical, but right. you're not a politician, so you can yes. Well, I, I actually am firmly opposed to anything like that. I mean, I, I don't think people should be compelled to vote. There are many people, including I have, Aida and I have, and Nico's here, and Richard, a couple of others. We have a colleague who will tell you in his very straight face, I never vote because it doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> okay. He has, that is his right also. And so if we say you have to vote, we have just taken, forced him to do something that, quite frankly, he has a right not to vote also. Um, I don't know, I mean, I think well, the only one country I think I'm right about this that sort of does it the way you describe it is Australia. And I'm not sure, you know, what they, they get much, necessarily get a better result from the fact that they drag people to the polls. I, I'm just concerned about the fact that people have a right not to vote. Uh, and they should be allowed to exercise that. Yes, uh, Louise. This is sort of related. Um, I mean, I understand that in presidential elections are one day as a part of broader pattern of, of voter suppression. But what was the original rationale? For making it one day, do you know? I mean, the, you mean why, just one day to vote? We have yeah. one day to vote. Well, you know, but historically, there's often been periods when the people could vote. You know, back in the days when you know, it, you know, you had to ride a horse, you know, <laughs> a day or two to get to something that looked like a. Uh, or sometimes you had to vote in the county seat. I mean, this idea of decentralizing the election. So why was it? I mean, well, I, 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 let me, let me, let me, yeah. tell me, can I give you a really cynical answer? Please. Because elections are too important to be left to the voters. Okay. And, and, it's, and, the, and the people who control the election machinery want to make sure they control the election outcome. And, and, and I think that 90% of what I've discussed in the last 30 minutes or so is attributed, can be attributed to the fact that people who run the elections just really want to make sure that they know who's going to get to vote. The one thing, I mean, politicians come in all shapes and sizes, obviously, but the one I've observed over my considerable years, the one thing they all have in common, whether they're left, right, Democrat, old, young, fat, skinny, whatever, the thing that they have in common is that they want predictability. The, the last thing you know, that either Mr. Romney or Mr. Obama really want is all of a sudden a flood of new voters because they don't know how they're going to vote. So the, I, the Democratic Party is not particularly active with recruiting. They say they are, but they're not really doing all that much. Um, the Republican Party is very careful about who they recruit uh, because they understand that the outcome of elections is too important to be left to willy-nilly, you know, the great unwashed who are going to march in. I mean, that's the other problem with the parties themselves. We just have a total count uh, with the, 
because it, it's, it's, it's just way too important. They don't want anything that's not predictable. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. And um, it's a great testament to the quality of the questions that I've already run out of two ideas. But I wanted to ask this one before I lose it. Um, it's very simple. Why in the world are supervisor of election a partisan office? Hmm. Uh, that's an excellent question to which there is no answer except <laughs> historical inertia. I, I, we used to have a sheriff in this community who was a close family friend. And we talked about that all the time. I mean, there's no reason why being sheriff should require a partisan affiliation or supervisor. In fact, you could That's make the, the okay, maybe in the case of the sheriff, it might actually make more sense because of their powers. But, and you remember, I don't, maybe you don't, uh, in 2000, when the when, uh, fiasco was going on here in Florida, the, the, the people who control the election machinery were the governor, Jeb Bush, and his secretary of state, Catherine Harris who were both among the most partisan Republicans imaginable. So they weren't going to let this thing go, get out of their grip. And you see what happened. So you raise an excellent question. I have no answer except it shouldn't be. But don't bet the farm on it happening anytime soon. It's not going to. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Then talk, talk about the reform efforts that actually are in place and that are stronger and what people can actually do. Because there's a lot to be upset about. but. Are there any strong reform efforts? Yeah, well, there are people, yes. Uh, I would associate myself with organizations like um, Vote.com. They are very active. Um, there are several other uh, organizations. Uh, Project uh, Vote Smart is another one. Um, I'd be happy if anybody sent me an email, I'd be happy to send a list. I, you know, it, it's, it's useful for the individual, but, you know, to sort of jump up and down and. And I think there's a lot of value in that. But sometimes it's, it's more important to associate yourself with an organization because they have more oomph. And, uh, but I would, I think, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but, but it's going to require a great groundswell of popular support to move some of this stuff one way or the other. And, and in fact, the groundswell seems to be the other way. Keep people from the polls. Don't include more, keep them out. You had a question. Um, I read recently a column in The Alligator that was talking, and I've heard about this a little bit recently, that um, that perfect democracy where everybody participates <coughs> could never happen, or that people aren't smart enough for that to really work. And I think this columnist is talking about how people shouldn't just vote for voting's sake, that if there's an issue that really affects a certain amount of, uh, a certain group of people, they should let those people decide. Um, I just want to know what you thought about that. Well, um, I, that troubles me very much. Uh, without getting into what's a democracy, um, it, it's very trouble. What, what the, it took forever in this country until 1965 to get rid of literacy tests. It took forever to get rid of character tests. I mean, literally, that used to be, and it was mostly aimed at uh, African Americans in the South, but not only. You wouldn't, you couldn't vote until you could get a, a letter of testimonial from somebody that you were an upstanding, especially Christian, person. Oh, they wouldn't let you vote. So I, 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 you know, and and. and Sort of this idea that you have to, you know, have a certain level of knowledge. I mean, it, you would like to think so. And as a professor, I, you know, I'm obviously trying to get my students and the public generally to learn more about um, politics, learn more about the issues. And the problem is, it's, to be honest, it's very hard to do that. And, and, and if you think you're going to learn anything about all that tonight, um, I have a bridge I want to sell. Because, I mean, who could be so gullible? These things are just staged, made for TV talking points. Um, but I, I don't like the idea of saying you can vote because you know how to spell Aeschylus, and you can't vote because you don't you can't solve a quadratic equation. That gets really problematic. Yes, please. Um, if there's one thing I've learned in my current uh, comparative elections class is that there's so many different arguments to a perspective, and one of the things that we've been talking about recently is how, and you touched on it as well, is. Um, how the habit of voting is established among people. And it takes about 
it takes three times for a voter to become an established <coughs> voter, which essentially means voter. it takes 12 years for that person, you know. At the presidential level, but before we do have exactly. interim. Exactly, at the presidential level. It takes a while, you're right, you're going right. And then another thing that you touched on, too, was how um, some people say that the exact opposite, that the if you, inf we've enfranchised people over the course of however many years, and because of that, you've created such a large sample size, a large N, that the, the rate at which the voters have caught up, they haven't caught up to the fact that we've brought in these you know, 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments that allow minorities and Africans to vote, as well as women, too. And I was just curious to know what your response is to that, because it seems like a compelling argument. But when you stand up here in front of me, like that's compelling too. So I just don't know <laughs> who to believe. Well, you don't have to believe any of us. Of course. I mean, that's a, in my class, is never required to believe the teacher at all. Um, I'm not sh really sure how to respond. I don't. I'm not sure I have a complete grasp of what exactly what you're asking me. I mean, just to give you one instance. Um, uh, the 13th, part of the 14th and the 15th Amendment were actually undermined by our own U.S. Supreme Court. And so they can, that's one way to, you know, sort of, if you want to go the constitutional way, they, they can just define it out of existence, which is if they, if we go back to what Joe, Joe was raising, um, if we have a constitutional amendment, they, they can just sort of negate it. But maybe I'm not speaking to your concern. I think what, the way, the way it seems to me is like, if you look at it, it's like a plane flying in the sky. The plane is flying at a certain rate, but the sound is traveling slower. And if you think of the plane as the legislation or the amendment that's been enacted, and the sound following it is the habit or the people voting, yeah. um, that's their argument, is that it's not, it hasn't caught up yet. And I think that racism and xenophobia play a huge role in that. And yeah. you did touch on that too. And I was wondering if you went more in depth in that in your book. Yeah, is, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, a huge percentage of it. I, I think Matthew had his hand up in the. Yeah, um, so, so, kind of to, like, to the contra of that, like, <clears throat> with such a long history of disenfranchisement in this country, um, and, I, and what, half the country really not actively voting in presidential elections, give or take? Yeah. What what role or do you feel a major role from like such a long history of disenfranchisement plays in in people's unwillingness or, or feeling like they shouldn't participate in, in national elections? Well, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, and, and, and I don't know that there is an answer. I'm more concerned about what things that happened in Jacksonville and Tampa in 2000 in African-American neighborhoods near the polling stations when sheriff's cars were parked near the entranceway deliberately because they knew that it would keep African Americans away from the police. So I, I guess I'm much more results oriented and looking at the practices. I, I don't know about this catching up. Uh, I don't know if you ever catch up. I mean, I don't agree with it. I was just curious. I, you know, the other thing is part of it, I, I made a comment about this, some of you, a couple of you in my campaigns class. I made a comment about this and it seemed to resonate with the students, is that a lot of the complaints about voting, about running elections, about, you know, crummy candidates, Tweedledum, Tweedledee, I mean, we have a choice of this guy, that guy. That's not really a, a criticism so much of the, uh, of the candidates as, as, as of our government generally. And I think if we had government that spoke more to real problems and, and addressed issues that affected, yes, the 47% of us, um, maybe there would be more enthusiasm for going out and voting. But since we have government which doesn't speak to the needs of too many Americans, then it's sort of hard to persuade them to vote. David, oh, I'm sorry. Michelle, do you want to get the last question? Couple more. Okay. Do you think it's an intentional disenfranchisement, like with our two-party system, that if you're fiscally conservative and socially conservative, you really can't vote? Well, you, you, you like, could vote. I mean, whether you have a choice or not, whether, whether you have a candidate you want is a, is, a, is a very different issue. I mean, you almost never get 
get the perfect candidate. I mean, that's. But do you think that it's like kind of exclusive that there's only two parties, or do you think that that's? Um, well, let me say this. Let, let me say this, and I, I, I and I were talking about this the other night. I mean, I don't know how this election is going to turn out, but let's assume for a moment that not only does Mr. Romney win, but the Republicans also win the Senate. Mm -hmm. I think that's the death of the Democratic Party as we know it. Because there'll be no, no reason for it to continue. It's probably been dead for 50 years, but it's just nobody, yeah, Dr. Nardi here about that, but probably nobody <laughs> signed the death certificate. Um, but you almost never get the candidate that you want. You sort of have to say, well, this guy is closer to me than that guy. Uh, we're not going to have a multi-party system. That's just not going to work in this country. But whether or not we have parties that are actually responsible, I think is what you're really asking. Um, political scientists have been f trying to figure that one out since the 1950s, and they haven't gotten very far with it, largely because the parties continue to be irresponsible. And I say, not in this book, but in my next book, I actually make the argument that the parties in the last 10 years have proven themselves to be incapable of governing, and that's both parties. It's a nonpartisan. But on the other hand, on November 6th, you're no different than I am. You walk in and you think, geez, I'm not sure about either of these guys, but I really have to vote for one of them. Holds your nose and your votes. <laughs> Should we sign books now, or what's the, what do you think? Else? Oh, yes, sir, you had a, you can get the last question. You said that the local something had too much discretion. So like well, voting officials, that would be at the state level and especially at the local level, yes, county level. State and, lo state and local officials had too much discretion. So, like, would you support, like, regulation over them? And, like, who would you think have the the authority to regulate such, such something so important? And, like, what regulations do you think? Well, I don't know. I, one of the things that we could do is get it out of the partisan uh, bill, bill part. I mean, that's clearly foolish. Um, that doesn't eliminate politics, but it does it does preside, uh, excuse me, it does create a sort of a cushion for the for the uh, supervisor. I, I think I, I, it's just sort of my thing, and those of you who've been in my class are probably sick of hearing me say this, but. But if you really want to move towards more democratic government, there's at least two things you have to do. There's more, but at least two. One is accountability. And right now, most of these people aren't accountable at all. And transparency. Do the stuff out in the public eye. You know, I'm one of those. Maybe I'm just too old at this point. But I think if this stuff is being hidden, there's probably a reason why it's being hidden. And I don't like it. And in the public's business, the public's business should be conducted in the public's eye. And there's no excuse for not having it. No, I don't want to get too excited. <laughs> Dave, are we done? Thank you.